you know, one of the concerns that I have, and, and you can list all these cultural impediments, but if there's never been an invitation to vote, then, you know, why do it? And, and that's the point. Let's make an invitation to vote. And when you make it hard, you know, think about this. Think about that you live in a residential area in Spirit Lake Nation. Uh, not a residential, but you're, you live in a rural area and you have a long driveway. The post office won't deliver to your door the way they deliver to everyone else's door. They make you go to a cluster box. And then the Secretary of State says, oh, you have a P.O. box. We can't possibly ship that ballot to a P.O. box. Can you imagine when, when, when Native people in my state and across the country serve in uniform at a much higher rate than most ethnic groups, and they're told because they have a P.O. box, having a P.O. box because the post office won't deliver, they now are disenfranchised. And the other problem is the problem of poverty. It's a problem of transportation. And when you can't, um, uh, when you require people to travel long distances to get health care, long distances to get their mail, long distances, it doesn't happen as frequently as what it should. And so let's not pretend that cultural barriers are the biggest problem here. The biggest problem here is that we have not invited Native people to vote the way we should invite Native people to vote given their contribution to our economy. And so if there is a way we can deal with this post office issue, and I think, you know, obviously you're well familiar with the challenges in North Dakota, um, but, you know, we've got to, to demand that um, in our government-to-government -government relationships that state governments that functionally run these, uh, uh, these voting apparatuses stop the nonsense. Why should we have to sue in North Dakota every year to get voting rights for Native people? I, you know, I, it, it is incredibly frustrating and it, it is incredibly important. And so um, I just think that the post office is part of this, this challenge. When the, when the ID, uh, the tribal ID doesn't have an address on it, that's not recognized as appropriate. We have a lot of Native Americans who are homeless in urban areas. What do we do when they don't have an address, when they're couch surfing? I mean, we've got, all the problems of poverty are overlaid on this problem of voting rights. And if we don't, as I say, extend an invitation to vote, they won't vote. And I, I agree that, that we need to do a better job explaining the importance of voting, but I know a lot of people who just don't want the hassle. And so, Mr. Tucker, how can we do better um, on, on, on our side, you know, to demand that state governments stop disenfranchising Native American people? Senator Heitkamp, thank you so much for that question. And what you alluded to, I, I want to point out, because this is also the overlay between census and voting. So all the issues you identified in terms of the difficulty of getting an identification card that's acceptable for purposes of registering to vote and casting a ballot. Can I, Mr. Tucker, can I just explain that we actually had convinced the Census Bureau a couple years ago to do a pilot project on Spirit Lake? Not Spirit Lake, but Standing Rock? They, they since have withdrawn their support for doing that pilot project. So, you know, when the time to actually test census uh, uh, methods in Indian country is quickly diminishing. And so the Census Bureau has refused to fund a project where we could have, I, I think the Navajo might have been the other test area that they withdrew support on. And so, you know, what, what is the message there? I mean, when you say this is about Census Bureau, I agree. Yeah, and I should also mention I'm a member of the National Advisory Committee, so this is an issue that we've raised repeatedly. The other one was actually the Colville Reservation in Washington State, oh, and the concern that we have is that the specific purpose of those two studies, they were going to be field tests to identify how are we going to deal with these non-traditional mailing addresses, and instead, the ramp up to 2020 census, all that was done was they did their field test in Rhode Island in a more urban environment. Now granted, there was some coverage of Latinos there, but there is a, a, no sizable American Indian Alaska Native population there, and certainly there isn't the level of uh, you know, concern that we have in terms of non-traditional mailing addresses. What needs to happen, in part it's ironic because there are already some federal laws in place that should control this because uh, for example, the National Voter Registration Act and the Help America Vote Act are supposed to allow for the ability of a voter who's trying to register to vote to, to draw a map on the registration form to identify exactly where their, their home is. 
Um, and just to put this in perspective for a lot of people who may not understand why this is an issue, uh, for example, in the Navajo Nation, it's very commonplace that you're not going to have a street address. You may not even have a P.O. box. Instead, the description of your home is going to be the third Hogan on the right, three miles down the road from the intersection of BIA Road 27 and 55. And so how do you do that? That is the question. Part of the, part of the response is we have to have more vigorous enforcement of existing federal requirements. But in addition, I, I, I know certainly one of the things we've been working with Senator Udall's office on is to strengthen uh, the requirements to, to accept non-traditional mailing addresses. The other issue that's related to it that you alluded to as well is the uh, housing instability and homelessness rate that leads to couch surfing. Um, it's a term we weren't familiar with until we heard it repeatedly during the field hearings. Uh, just to put this in perspective, on the, st on the um, Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, over 55% of the population of the Wind River Reservation does not have a full-time residential address. Mm. What percent? 55. 55. 55. And the estimate um, on the Navajo Nation, it ranges from anywhere from between 50 to 90,000 people on the Navajo Nation. So it is a huge problem. And I should say there's not going to be, it's something that there's no simple magic bullet solution. It's going to require many layers of, of um, responses and solutions to that. I know Secretary Oliver's office has, has dealt with it. I know that you deal with this in the Navajo Nation. Uh, but again, the, the two points I would leave with are um, enforcement of existing laws and strengthening them through some of the proposed legislation that we've been working with members of the committee on. Yeah. I think she had um, a Yes, I, I'd like to add to that. So, you know, thank you so much, Senator, for um, bringing up the point of residential addresses. Um, they affect all aspects of voting. So, you know, uh, the lack of a residential address will affect your registration, as Mr. Tucker described, um, with the difficulty registering. It will also affect mail-in balloting, which is an increasingly popular option. Um, but unfortunately, if you don't have an address to mail it to, uh, you're going to be left out of the system. Additionally, you know, as you mentioned, many people turn then to the P.O. box system. Well, the P.O. box system has flaws. Uh, the hours are incredibly limited. Um, you know, it might be open only a Tuesday from 3 to 4. Um, and so people aren't regularly accessing their mail. They could conceivably miss an entire election cycle before they're able to access their mail. Um, additionally, P.O. boxes, like housing, are scarce. And so multiple families, um, we receive testimony that multiple families are sharing a P.O. box. So, you know, there's conceivably three, four families, not just individuals, sharing a P.O. box, which then, you know, we anticipate may lead to problems registering using that P.O. box, which, you know, as you mentioned, sometimes P.O. boxes are never even accepted in the first place. But if they are, um, the P.O. box uh, could conceivably pose an issue on that regard. Um, and so, you know, mail-in balloting poses problems for, for Native Americans. One possible solution is to use, um, uh, allow tribes to designate a building that can receive ballots, can be used as a registration address, address and can be uh, used as a ballot drop-off location. And so if you enable, empower tribes to be able to you know, use that system, then maybe mail-in balloting can be accommodated on reservations. Um, but they'll certainly be facing problems if, it, uh, if, if it's just um, implemented as it stands today. And the final area of residential addresses um, certainly impact is voter ID. So um, you know, voter ID has a, has a a range of issues. One, tribal IDs are not always accepted on um, uh, uh, by states, um, so that should you know universally be the case. And you know the tribe uh, itself may not issue an ID. A BIA or another federal agency might issue the ID. So we have to be sure to encompass um, all of those IDs um, in the tr in the identification process. But where residential addresses come into play is on the ID itself. Um, if states have a requirement, for example, um, of a residential address, or as um, I was mentioned, an expert, a requirement of an expiration date. Um, they like to say, you know, you never expire being Indian. And so, and so it's commonly the case that, um, you know, tribal IDs don't have an expiration date. So a residential address requirement will immediately disenfranchise uh, Native Americans as will an expiration date. 
sorry. May I also just point out that um, the census is dramatically off. And, and by the way, my friends in Narragansett would be very upset if I didn't mention that Rhode Island does have a pretty significant uh, Indian population. But also, even as on a place in Massachusetts on Martha's Vineyard, we have a lot of people that have post office box, just as you said, shared families, multiple families, but also the couch surfing, um, whether it's on the reservation or in the communities because of affordable housing, lack of housing. And overlapping that with the census, there's also the problem that people will not divulge that there are so many people and they're living in overcrowded housing because then that brings on a, another whole set of problems for the tribal members. So it's, it's all integrated, it's all interrelated, but again, I think it goes right back to the models of working directly with the tribes, allowing the tribes to be able to determine that outreach, identification, and we all know our communities. It, it's a very stringent um, qualification that the tribes have to go through in order to demonstrate eligibility for federal programs. So therefore, the census doesn't use it. The funding systems that utilize the census for formulas doesn't allow the tribe, doesn't typically allow the tribes to do it. And I think that that's part of the government to government relationship. That's part of the respect of the sovereignty. And that I think is the fundamental problem with why tribes are having such a difficulty with the um, enrollment and registration and voting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator can, Heitkamp, yeah. for your participation. Yeah. Can, can, I just, can I just mention that um, let's not let another 10 years go by without solving these problems. I mean, the absolute frustration because it does build at the census, it does build with the relationship, you know, uh, uh, person to person, government to government. And, and we have to get the election administrators, whether they're in the counties or whether they're in the state, to actually recognize these challenges. And, and they are, they, to, if you expand beyond this, this is disenfranchising poor people. I mean, this isn't just about disenfranchising Native people, it's disenfranchising poor people. Um, and not inviting them to vote because you make it hard for them to vote. vote. Now we can say whether that's voter obstruction or whether that is just you know voter protection. I, I don't care what it is. I know the challenges. And I find insult to injury when we don't deliver in the postal service to their home, that means they don't have a residential address. We give them maybe a cluster box 20 miles away, deliver to that maybe every third day, and then we say good luck voting by mail, right? I just, it, it can't, it's got to get fixed. Yeah. Go, go ahead. If I, if I may briefly, Senator, on that point, um, I'm very interested in bringing vote by mail to New Mexico. This is something that I'd like to do because we do see in states that utilize it much higher participation. But these issues that you've brought up, Senator Heitkamp, are exactly my concern. Um, we saw that when Utah went to a vote by mail implementation in the Navajo areas of Utah where folks were not getting their ballots. Um, and so that brings me back to a comment that Mr. Keel made earlier, which is that uh, we have to address the digital divide in Indian country because if we're gonna find solutions to these problems that involve in-person voting, vote by mail, turning our tribal buildings into polling places, expanding early voting and having adequate education, digital divide, uh, conquering that is absolutely crucial and fundamental and should honestly be a priority of every single person who does this kind of work in, in uh, tribal parts of this nation. I've gotta get back yeah, to banking. Yeah. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.